All right, so the theme of today's video is going to be all about the importance of land conservation. The plot of land in which I'm heading is for sale, and if sold, could be graded, logged, and a house built. And with it, all of the amazing species that go with it. You know, people always email me and ask me what the best thing they could do for plants in the environment is. And for me, the best answer is land conservation and land restoration. But land conservation has to come first at some level. So yeah, let's go see what could be lost. This is a common theme of hiking. Southern Appalachia, rhododendron forests. They call them roto hells down here because they can be very thick and tough to get through. And rhododendron produces this dust that can irritate the eyes and whatnot, but I love them for the shade kind of tropical look they give. Now, I know for a fact that there's something extremely special up here, but let's see what we find along the way. Now, the people around this area tell me that this spot was spared for now because of how steep the grade is, and it would just be too expensive for most people to come in and level it to put a house. But that might not always be the case. Economies change. Who knows what the future could bring if this land is not protected. Well, already finding some orchids. This you will remember from our evergreen episode is the crane fly orchid. It grew its leaves in the fall, photosynthesizes throughout the winter because of its ability to photosynthesize at extremely low temperatures. Come summer, that leaf will rot back and it'll throw up a really cool little flower stalk. Alright, we've got one of the grape ferns here. Used to be Botrychium, might still be, I don't know, I'll put the name here. But this is a really cool fern because it's mycorrhizal, extremely dependent on mycorrhizal associations. In fact, for most of its life, it lives underground, feeding entirely off of its relationship with that fungus. It's mostly parasitic in the early days and then becomes more photosynthetic and mutualistic as it uh, ages and produces its first leaves. But this is a great indication that the soils around here are healthy. Here's a fun liverwort growing on a tree. I think this is Metzgeria or Metzgeria. But super nice little colony of it here. Despite the winter temperatures, it's nice and green. Hardy, yet delicate. Now this area Southern Appalachia is known for its clean, biodiverse rivers, and one of the reasons they're so wonderful is because they're all fed in large part by these amazing, crystal clear, hyper cool, hyper clean mountain streams. This little stream originated somewhere up the mountain abyss. It's coming out of the groundwater. All these wonderful trees and plants are filtering it. And left untouched, it will feed clean, cool water into the bigger river systems. But if someone were to develop here, you know, rip out all of these plants, plant a lawn, fertilize it, create all this erosion and chemical uh, seepage, I guess, into the creek. That slowly contaminates the larger river systems, not to mention destroying beautiful mountain streams like this in the process. Yeah, this slope here is about the only thing that's saved this property thus far. It's too heavy to build a house on as is, so you'd have to bring in a ton of equipment, rip up this whole chunk of land just to put a house and all the other things that are needed, driveways and whatnot. So for now, the extreme elevation here has saved this plot of land. Seems this winter green had a good year. That right there is a little seed pod. It produces tiny dust-like seeds that require fungus for germination. Here's another evergreen, albeit we should call it an ever red. It's either a heucra or a tiarella, one of the foam flowers. I'm not certain at this point it's growth, but here it is just growing on the side of a slope, full of anthocyanins, protecting it from the extremes of winter. More orchids. Downy rattlesnake plantain. Living in this dense understory. Feeding off a of fungus and what little light it can receive.
This right here is why they call it rattlesnake plantain. These are the seed heads. So there's some successful pollination, but when they're kind of ripening to the point of being ready to disperse, they blow around like a little rattlesnake's tail. There's the plant down there. Made it out of the major rhododendron thicket, and uh, you can see the stream a lot better in the valley that it's coming from. Look at this. So adorable. Great little uh, stream side plant community here, filled with bryophytes, lycopods, liverworts, the hepatica. Look at this, we've got some great liverworts right here. Beautiful. Really enjoying the nice humid microclimate. Although we won't see any of them today, Southern Appalachia is a hot spot for salamander diversity and stream banks like this are super important salamander habitat. All of the filtering processes that the plants and fungi do for the soil and the water benefits sensitive amphibians like salamanders and a fair share of frogs as well. This little chunk of hillside is just chock full of uh, hepatica. This looks like a cutaloba, those pointed leaflet tips. This is a great ant dispersed species. Ants in the genus of Phenogaster take the seeds, eat off this tiny little eliasome, which I think is actually fake in this species, so they're tricking the ants. Nonetheless, the ants get rid of the seeds, throw them into their middens or somewhere else out in the forest, and uh, the plants then germinate far away from their parents. Another component of a healthy forested ecosystem down here. Speaking of interesting fungal communities, check out this little, I don't know, what would you call that? It's not a toadstool. What kind of fungus is this? There's this little boulder field here in the creek and it looks like during the summer this is a beautiful wetland sedge community. You know, people talk about habitat destruction, usually in the context of places like the rainforest or these faraway exotic lands, but it's happening in your own backyards all the time on various scales. You know, this is where you can affect change the most in your own neighborhood. Here's what's left of last summer's maidenhair ferns. They love shaded hillsides like this. And to see a nice thriving colony, especially from afar, it's just jaw-droppingly gorgeous. So this right here is a very special mushroom. It's a polypore known as Ganoderma suge, and it feeds only on dead hemlock wood. Specialized and has proliferated quite heavily since the hemlocks have been dying off in droves thanks to the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. Check the show notes for more info on that. I don't think there's enough emphasis on the importance of rotting wood in forests, especially. Rotting wood is not only a good component of how forest soils are made, it's what's feeding all of the microbial life that then goes on to feed countless other organisms, especially plants, and especially sensitive plant species, like orchids and that grape fern we saw earlier. So when you clear a forest and you get rid of all this dead wood, you're starving it of what recharges it. Do my eyes deceive me or is this what we've come looking for? It's a hint of what's to come everyone. Onward and upward. Check out this Huperzia colony. Wow. It's like the dominant ground cover in this little knoll in the forest here. Incredible. And here is what we came looking for. No, this is not a bromeliad. This is a sedge. And it's an extremely awesome sedge at that. This is Carex regeriana. I found this population a few years ago. 
exploring around here looking for plants and insects, but to the best of my knowledge, it's the first record of this plant in this county, which is very exciting. Now, in the spring, I believe, these sedges produce arguably the most beautiful flowers of all of the sedges. They're bright white, very showy, and it's believed that they're probably insect pollinated, although there hasn't been enough research on this to say for sure. But look at these leaves. My goodness. Here's a juvenile, another juvenile, one hiding over the ledge there, which is really encouraging because it tells me that this population is at least recruiting new individuals. It's reproducing successfully. Now, sedge ID is not easy for me, but these are incredible plants and really easy to spot. Now, this species was once thought to be unique enough to warrant its own genus, but it has since been moved back into Carex. I don't remember exactly when that happened. Some have suggested that it's a relictual lineage, like sister to most of the other Carex that we know and love. Look at that plant. Another important point to make is that plants do not receive the same protection that animals do. Despite this being an endangered sedge, the fact that it's growing on private property means that with landowner permission, I could do whatever I wanted to these sedges. Dig them up, destroy them, burn them, anything like that. We just simply don't value plants like we do animals. Despite the fact that literally everything depends on healthy plant communities for survival. So if this wonderful little chunk of land gets developed, all of the species we saw today, including the extremely rare and uh, growing ever rarer by the year, this wonderful Carex fregeriana will be gone, lost, another population destroyed because someone wanted a vacation home or something down here. This is why land conservation matters. Doesn't matter if it's not a huge national park or something on a broad scale. Little chunks of land get eaten up each and every day, and with them all of the species that grow and prosper here. If this were to be logged, it would be a complete tragedy. So this is why you support your local land conservancy. Get on Google, type in land conservancies in my area, and give them money, give them your time, spread the word, support them in any way you possibly can, because they're saving chunks of land like this.